hopefully they'll get here. But anyway, you know, there's coming a day, not on this side of eternity, eternity, Virgil, but when we reach glory, I won't need these glasses. Won't need them hearing aids, will you? Amen. Listen, getting old won't even be a concern, will it? Think about that. Much less having to tr- uh, worry and uh, fight against the struggle of sin. I thank God for it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the Lord's called us to work. And the time to work is now. We're looking forward to our Wednesday night Bible study starting back. We've got some things there that we're praying about. We ask for your prayers. And if you have a question, a biblical question, and you want clarification, want an answer, if you want to bring that, we'll look into those things from time to time. We ask for your prayers going forward in that as to where we're going to turn, uh, where the Lord would lead us. But we're looking forward to that when uh, March the 2nd, beginning our Bible study here Wednesday evening at 6.30 at the church. So please come on out and be a part of that. Invite someone. Whoop, what would I do there? There it went. Come back. <laughs> so anyway, we're looking forward to that. You come be a part of it. I want you to go ahead and be this morning, turning in your Bible as we're thinking. Talking about time, look into Acts chapter 24 with me for our time together. I want to ask you a question. Is there a more convenient season? I'm going to give you some of the background to this uh, scene that Paul is a part of. And then I'm going to stop and give you four reasons. Four reasons why there'll never be a more convenient time than now. And this is going to go to the center. If you're here this morning, you've never surrendered your heart or your life to the man Jesus Christ. There'll never be a better time. Christian, if the Lord's prodding you, and you know if He is or not, into more faithful service, there'll never be a more convenient time. We may lift some excuses here in a few minutes as to why we don't. However, we really have no good excuse when it comes to the work that God has given each and every one of us. And it takes the congregation of the local church to fulfill the work given to her. Now the head of that work, if you will, the head of that body is Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm not sure what I should be doing. Let the head answer that question. And what I mean is, you'll find it right here. We make a great many excuses from the pulpit to the back row. But the time for excuses should cease. We're called to work. We're called to serve. And there's never going to be a more convenient time than this moment. You cannot go to the past. There's regrets, there's wonderful memories, right? There's both. But looking forward, we can make a difference in someone's life. Lost person, you can, I've said it before, you can leave this place way different than the way you come in if you'll surrender your heart and life to Jesus. That's up to you. I would not come to you in your pew and tell you face-to-face in that manner. I wouldn't embarrass anyone that way. They'd probably never come back to church, rightfully so. But you know now is the time. So I want us to look in this passage of Scripture this morning in Acts chapter 24. And I'm going to spend a few minutes giving you the background uh, of this this couple that Paul is dealing with. How many Bibles do we have in God's house this morning? Hold them high. This is living Word of God. Amen. Bring your copy of God's Word to His house. You'll be glad you did. If you're able to this morning, our time together, could you please stand out of respect and for the reading of God's Word. We're only going to read two verses. Um... Acts chapter 24, verse 24 and 25. And Dr. Luke writes, After certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way, for this time... When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, and folk, you may sit down. Be seated. (laughs) I'm going to 
That was a little bit rude. I apologize for that. You may be seated. <laughs> Would you sit down? <laughs> God help us this morning. <laughs> I'm as fallible as the next one, right? <laughs> I'm not too polished. You'll see if you look over here and ask my family, they'll tell you he's not quite as polished as he may seem from time to time. I'm just country. That's all I know to be. Amen. I'm just wavering. I want to share with you this morning our passage of Scripture. Now, I want to set up the background uh, concerning this uh, scene here. Now, Paul is on trial. Okay, the Jews have harassed him uh, from pillar to post, if you will. They've chased him all over uh, Ju- uh, the region and all over. Now they've chased him all over Jerusalem, and he's caused a stir. And the Jews don't like him. They could care less for Paul because of his message. Sounds a whole lot like the world today. They won't, don't want anything to do with this man, Jesus. And here we have the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what Paul is presenting, and um, that's what he's been presenting. And so now... Uh, this, he is called before this Felix. He's like the governor, if you will. He holds, he holds the same position as Pontius Pilate held when Jesus was crucified. He is the procurator, if you will, of Judea. And so uh, this Felix is, a, is an interesting character. So I want to break him down to you. And I want you to see in verse 24, it speaks of Felix and his wife, Drusilla, who is a Jew. Now we look and done some uh, uh, st- uh, study. If you do some study on Felix... As I said, he is the governor there of Judea, Judea, but he's a very unscrupulous man. His character is is something to look at and behold. Uh, he's kind of one of those we'd kind of look at from afar, uh, in our, and if we ain't careful in self righteousness and say, "I don't know about that cat bird," but that's exactly what this kind of what he's like. Uh, actually, when we uh, Josephus has a little more to say about him from Jewish history, Josephus uh, basically presents him as a man who considered himself above the law. We know anybody like that today? Amen. There's a lot of folk out there like that today. Felix himself had no conviction about his choices or his lifestyle. Basically, he took Drusilla, if you will, seduced her from another man uh, she was already married to or betrothed to. So that tells us a little bit about his character, right? He was a very unrepentant man as well. The Bible talks about those kind of folk ruling over. When the Bible says when the righteous ruleth, the people are, uh, uh, if you will, flourish. But when the wicked rule, we suffer. Amen. And I still believe that holds true today. So God help us. And I think that application can be made right down to the local church, if you will. Leadership ought to be looking to seek God's face first. If our government would seek God's face first, we'd see some changes. Amen. We know that doesn't happen. Uh, As far as his sin, like a great many people today... Felix just looked at his sin, if you will, uh, and rather than confess it as we should and the Bible teaches us, Felix actually flaunted his sin. Does that ring a bell with you today, folk? Till we know how folk like that are. And I'm not trying to be self-righteous as I stand up here on this podium. But I tell you, we've got a great... Here's, the, here's Let's just go... This is where we're at today when we talk about that little, little ugly word, sin. You know what we call it now? We call it alternate lifestyles. We call it uh, 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 someone who's maybe just kind of slipped up, made a mistake, maybe made a bad life choice, okay? Maybe made a bad decision, or pretty good old boy, he just didn't know him. He didn't know exactly what he's getting into. We kind of cover up sin, if you will, anymore. We don't want to use that word, Virgil, because you know what? We're a little bit better. We're polished now in the 21st century. We're a little bit better than sin today. Matter of fact, and I think if we ain't careful, we're going to end up just like Adam and Eve. When she saw that fruit, she said, I know what? One thing. He said, you know what? I can be like God. I think I'll try that. And that's kind of where as a society we've got to. You said, now preacher, listen, there's no need in getting on us too hard in here. We're pretty good old folk. Amen, I know you are. I love your church, and I thank God that you've, uh, I've been called to serve here, and I want to serve you faithfully. And if I'm going to do that, we've got to be honest. We're sinners in need of God's grace. As Paul said, I'm the chiefest. When, Paul, when I come to that verse, I say, excuse me, Paul, I'm the chiefest. But old Felix didn't do any of that. Felix flaunted his sin. And God help folk today that are flaunting their sin. We've got to be very careful, folk. We've got to look at a holy and righteous God and say, God, I am in need of your grace. Think about Matthew, the tax collector. I mean, this man thought he had everything figured out, was making a pocket full of money, but when he met Jesus, from the silence of Scripture, we know he was under conviction. When he wrote about his own conversion, if you will, his encounter with Jesus. I think about the old demoniac. I was talking to one of the boys this week. (laughs) 
the demoniac, is, he's an interesting character, is he not? Had mental issues far and above beyond anything most of us can imagine. The scriptures portray him as a man, a wild man, naked, running through the graveyard. He said, boy, I'd never get that low. Before Jesus Christ, we're naked and we're sinners. We're ugly. Sin makes us ugly. It separates us from a holy God. We find this demoniac running wild in the tombs. He could not get a moment's peace. When he encountered Jesus from that story, remember Luke writes and says, he come up to him and he asked him, what's your name? He said, no, my name is Legion for we are many. A multitude of demons possessed his body. And yet in that story, the Lord Jesus looked at that man and had compassion on him. And said, told those demons to get out of his body. They said, listen, don't just... Look. That's a whole, a whole other story. We studied demonology. But they wanted to inhabit a body. And they just, if it was nothing else, give us the pig's body. And the Bible says they heard a swine was there. And they rushed off down that hill and they entered a swine. And when they entered into those swines. And they rushed. And they, rather than have to deal with those, those demons, those swine killed themselves. But the beautiful part of the story. <laughs> that demoniac... It's found sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. <laughs> That's what Jesus Christ can do for your sin problem. That's what Jesus Christ does for my sin problem. Meets it head on, addresses it. 1 John 1, says, 1 and 9 says, If we are faithful to confess our sins, he is just, I mean, excuse me, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, or as the Greek interprets it, to keep cleaning us from unrighteousness. Because we're sinners. Felix had no concept of that. He said, I'm better than. When we talk about Felix, not only did he flaunt his sin, but this prideful attitude led to a searing of his conscience. Searing of his conscience. You ever tried to witness to somebody and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt you were not getting through? You ever done that? That's hard. This is part of the reason why. Friend, I say this with a broken heart. And I want you to be warned this morning. Don't allow your sin to sear your conscience to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it can happen. I'm not saying Felix was there yet because we see a man under conviction here in a moment. But you go ahead and you read the rest of the story. You read two more verses about Felix. And the Bible is silent concerning Felix after this. That says a lot about what he did. The choices he made. Under his rule, it was so bad that if you'll study it out, the Jewish Sikari, these are a band of assassins. They, they would carry small daggers. That's what Sikari means. They, some to the, some to, to the uh, translation, uh, small dagger carriers, if you will. And they were assassins. They were, uh, they were the zealots, if you will. Remember Jesus called Simon the zealot? He was one of those. Some think. And so these Sicarii, these assassins, these Jewish assassins, these guys, this uh, group, they flourished under his rule because he was so oppressive to the Jews. And Felix, holding this power, powerful position in Roman government, thought he was better than the folk. But you see, power did not produce peace in the heart of Felix. And we move on real quickly in verse 24 and we see his wife, Drusilla. They say she was a very beautiful woman. She was a Jew. She was actually the daughter of Herod Agrippa I and the granddaughter of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one who, when Jesus Christ was born, there in Matthew's Gospel, when the wise men came, visited Jesus, uh, there was one in a dream, or excuse me, came to Herod asking where the child was. Uh, they, uh, Herod told him, listen, oh, listen, y'all go. I want to worship him too. Bring me word where he's at. I'd like to go worship this new king. We know that was a lie. And the herd, when you read about the herds in the Bible, it's the same story over and over. They were usurpers. They had no claim to the throne of Israel, yet there they are in power. And so this uh, Herod Agrippa is, I mean, Herod the Great is the one who said, uh, go and uh, 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 send me word back. But we know what he done. All the children, two years and under, were killed because of his ruthlessness. This is Drusilla's grandfather. 
Agrippa, her father, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember right, is the one who had James killed. Anyway, we know through the hurries that they were killing the early believers, the early church believers. And so uh, when we find a little bit about this here, Drusilla, I want to paint the picture of these two people before I present the witness of Paul to them. So that's why we're going through this. She was in an unhappy marriage with a man by the name of Azesus. He was the king of Emesa. And with help of a Cyprian sorcerer, a sorcerer, she was seduced by Felix. That's a heck of a way to meet your wife, ain't it? Witchcraft. That's how he met her. I don't know about you, but I can't see it getting much better there, can you? But that's the scene we have before us. You see, friends, sin carries people farther than they want to go. But as long as we have breath, and as long as they have breath, and when Jesus Christ presents the opportunity, as Paul does here in just a moment, gives them the gospel. You say, I'll never go down and see that one. That drunk living down there that, that cussed my mom and daddy. That one that, that, that's pushing dope and peddling dope and doing dope all the time. That thief, that one that wronged me. You're not going to get me to go see them. Yet here we have Paul standing before the very people who despise him giving the gospel. Be careful, friends. Be careful, Christian. That kind of attitude does not pr- produce fruit uh, fit for repentance, if you will. I know there's some tough uh, cookies out there. I know there's some tough nuts to crack. I understand that. I was one of them. But I tell you, the gospel is still working in hearts and lives today. When we talk about this uh, uh, Drusilla, as a matter of fact, it went a little further. By marrying Felix, he's a Gentile, she defied Jewish law. I mean, they didn't care. They just heaped on to themselves sin upon sin upon sin. We find that she attended Paul's interrogation here, not as a court officer, but as an interested observer. Now, I don't know. The Bible is silent on her completely, but here she is hearing the gospel. What she did with it, we don't know. We talk about this Drusilla. You see, passion ruled her heart. What's that phrase people use today? You've got to trust your heart. Y'all ever use that? You don't have to answer, but you ever use that? You've got to trust your emotions. You've got to, got to trust how you feel. The Bible's made it clear what we are. If we chase our hearts, what does Jeremiah say about our heart? The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it outside of God? Be careful when we trust our heart. Now, don't get me wrong. Valentine's is last week. I love my wife, Rebecca. When I met her, Virgil, I knew she was the one. I didn't tell her that for a few months, but I knew she was the one. Amen. And I would bend over backwards. I would give my life to her. Matter of fact, I've been doing it this week. For those of you who don't know, she needs prayer. She's in a bad way. She's done something to her back. Carol, she just can't move. I've washed dishes all week. I've helped get her. I have had to get her up off the chair. I about had to put her in bed. John, I'll keep doing it for her because she's mine. You know what I'm saying? But that's because we have built and solidified 29, almost 30 years together. But when I met her, I mean, they had to be, that thing had to line up. I, you know, you be careful with your hearts, what I'm saying. But passion ruled this Drusilla, as we see from evidence in history. But passion, listen to me, passion does not produce peace either. Okay? So there we have this couple. They're a shameless couple. And let's go on to verse number 25. Now we see what Paul did in his, with the gospel. Now this is, a, this is a nice three-point division of the gospel. Paul says in verse 25, the Bible says, He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come to Felix. That's Paul presented the gospel. Presented him the gospel. Righteousness, which is in Christ Jesus. What does Peter say about Jesus Christ and his righteousness? The just, Jesus Christ, for the unjust, Wayburn Mosley. That's the righteousness. When I, come to, when I come to God, if I approach God in my self-righteousness, no, 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 there might as well be a wall uh, a mile thick. But when I come to God Almighty pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, and glory to God, let's never leave the blood out of the equation. Amen. Let's sing about the blood. Let's talk about the blood. Let's preach about the blood. Let's teach about the blood. Let's learn about the blood. Because without the blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the blood, there's nothing to take away our sin. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that does that. And so Paul says right here, it is righteousness, if you will, Felix. Righteousness in one man, Jesus Christ. Do you hear me, Felix, what I'm saying to you? 
And he goes on to the second point. He says, temperance. Temperance. Or another word, and this is one that could be, uh, uh, needs to be preached on more, self-control. Obedience in Christ Jesus. We see in Jesus Christ a man who was obedient. He said, thy will be done. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, Jesus says, thy will be done, Lord, in his prayer. It's a, a, a model prayer. But thirdly, Paul comes to this, something future. Now, righteousness, we can go all the way back to the cross and see that. If you want to look at it from a, a perspective, look at it, a spiritual or biblical perspective, righteousness in Christ Jesus at the cross, temperance, it still applies today, self-control, living like Jesus Christ, looking like Jesus Christ, acting like Jesus Christ. That's what he wants out of his church. And then thirdly, looking forward to a judgment to come. Oh, my goodness. The people today that think there ain't going to be no judgment or that the whole whole group that goes on about how God is love. Y'all hear them all the time? Well, they're in the front pews of the church, ain't they? They're the first ones at church. They're the first ones that look like what they're doing. I'm not making light of nobody. If you're looking on live stream, I promise you, just because you can't see them, there's people in the church, amen. Somebody asked me the other week, says, how many you got to go there? I said, it looks like a pretty good crowd. He said, I couldn't see nobody on the live stream. I said, most of them's in the back. I said, but I promise you they're there, amen. <laughs> you see where you need to sit, amen. Sit on your head if you need to, but just let me preach a little while, right? Amen. But anyway, uh, we got this crowd today that says, uh, God is love and everything's all right. I believe that with all my heart, and I see that at the cross of Calvary, God showed us His love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Amen. That takes care of all of it, doesn't it? But Paul says something here about judgment to come. Friend, we know that, don't we? We know. We've been in church. We know there's a judgment coming. But there's a world that are so flippant that says God is love, and that's it. That's all they know. Little do they know that our Lord Jesus is going to return. When he comes back to this earth, one of two things is going to happen. When he comes back, let me put this, when he comes back and gets this church called the rapture, the believers are going up. We're going up. Amen. You believe that this morning? Can I get a show of hands on that one? I would like to say amen. I hope you know that. Are you going up? Amen. You ain't going to, you know, if you're going up, amen. We're going up. And then seven years after that, he's coming back. And like the old boy said the other night, going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives. The Bible says it's going to cleave split in two. And if you're on the wrong side of his judgment then, it's too late. Your fate is sealed. A lake of fire awaits you. That's judgment. You say, preacher, that don't sound like a loving God. Well, I got news for you. God loved you enough to take upon himself the sin of the world. The psalmist said this. I've been studying this this week. I've been looking at the tabernacle again in the wilderness. And I just come across something. I'm 50 years old. I've been studying God's word. I don't know much. And every time I turn around, I find something new. You know what? That bra- the, the brazen or the brass altar, the first item that you see there in the temple when you walk in the courtyard of the temple, the court of the Gentiles, there's a brass, brass altar sits there. And that brass altar represents judgment. Hello? God is love, but God judges. The first thing we see is judgment. And the psalmist says this, Bind him, if you will, to the four corners of the altar. I didn't know there was four horns on that altar, uh, Virgil. I got to studying that out. You know what four means? It means universal. That means the judgment that Jesus Christ, or the salvation that is offered through Jesus Christ, is universal. It got us all. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad of that this morning. You might hear that coming up in another message sometime. Bind him, the pastor of the psalmist said, to the four horns of the altar. I'm glad my Lord Jesus bound himself to the altar, if you will. I'm glad Jesus Christ came, looked, and every time he would, I believe he'd handle a piece of wood. He'd think about what was about to come up one day when he was going to go to a place called Calvary where he and the Father alone was going to go. And glory to God, he looked. He looked death in the face. He looked hell in the face. And he said, bring what you got. He said, because I got just a little more. And they thought they had him. Hey, this guy get excited. They thought they had him three days there. Old Satan said, he's dead. The demons of hell were celebrating. Everybody was carrying on down there. But on this side here, we find enough a room, a group of people scared to move, didn't know what to do. But I got news for them one day, three days later, on the first day of the week, the Bible says, they went down there and Mary said, I got to finish what we didn't finish. She goes and she said, where is he at? He ain't here, the angel said, for he is risen. Amen. That took care of it for me. I try not to spit on nobody. I'm sorry. I get excited. When I think about the empty tomb, I get excited. Those of you who've lost your loved ones in Christ, let me tell you something. It ain't the end. You say, preacher, it hurts. I know it does. I can imagine. I had a friend. 
his name was Buddy too, Buddy Color down at Holly Springs Baptist Church. Oh, Buddy was sick from the day I, the day I went down there. Never was good health. Been over in Vietnam, served his country. Come back and had, I don't know if it's Agent Orange or what, but his body was pretty bad shape. Buddy wasn't no big man. Those of you who met my mama, about the size of my mama, is a good heart. I went to visit him one of the last times. He said, I'm going to be heading over to hospice here. And I called him, that's what it was. He called me, he said, I'm, I'm heading over to hospice. I, I, you know, it broke my heart because he was a friend. And uh, I said, buddy, I, I hate to hear that we both know it was coming. I said, you're getting ready to take a little trip, ain't you? It's funny how the Lord uses some things sometimes. Holy Spirit got a hold of that. He, he chuckled. He said, yeah. He said, pretty soon I'm going to take a big trip. <laughs> Whew. Preaching to me and me trying to be a help to him. He said, preacher, I'm going to take a big trip. It wasn't about a day or so he took that trip on home. He stepped out. He was released, if you will, from the burden of sin, the bondage of sin in his body. And I believe he's over there today celebrating with loved ones going on before, looking and hoping and praying. Well, not praying, but looking and waiting for the day when the body of Christ is reunited. I'm looking forward to seeing him. If your loved ones died in Christ, you'll see him again. You can take comfort in that. But I tell you, friend, we got to give them the gospel in its fullest, and that's what Paul does here. Remainder of our time here, I want us to look at one thing. We see later on, we see in verse 25, I'm going to go from there, look at what Felix said. The Bible says that Felix trembled. He was under conviction. There's no two ways about it. I stood and preached, and I've seen tears roll down, stream down eyes, and people walk out the door lost. I've seen it. I stood and preached, and I've seen people fidget in a funeral and squirm, looking at their loved one, knowing that things ain't right them and the Lord. If they died, they died lost, and they're going to be separate. I've seen them squirm and carry on and still reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Felix says these words, and we're going to give you the four, point, four reasons. He says, go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call upon you, Paul. I want to give to you this morning before we leave, I'd like to give you four reasons why there will never be a more convenient season to address the matter of salvation in your life or service and commitment to Jesus Christ. You, whichever one fits you this morning. You say, I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get those. My father-in-law says, I'm going to get the whole shooting match. I'm after all of you. I want the gospel. I want the news. I want these reasons to, be, to resonate in your heart. I'm not trying to drum up some kind of false spirit. I want you to, if you take it home with you, I want you to pray about it. If you come to this altar, I'll help you pray about it. But a lost person, don't leave this place in the same condition you came in. Christian, you don't have to leave wondering what should I do, how should I do, or should I even do. I'm going to give to you four reasons why there's never a more convenient season to address the matter of salvation or service to Jesus Christ. And if you, if you want to look, look with us, you'll see this. There's no better time that will come. You can't go back to yesterday. You can't steal from tomorrow. It might never get here. We're always chasing tomorrow. No better time will come. You think about it just a moment. There's no more better time than to get right with Jesus than right now. There's no better time, Christian, to say, you know what? I'm going to pull up my bootstraps. I'm going to tighten my belt. I'm going to gird my loins, if you will. By the way, think about that just a moment. You think old Job wanted to keep going there in his day of calamity? You think Job wanted to keep going? Everything Job knew, everything but his flesh, I mean, everything but his uh, life was gone. And what did God tell him over there? Something that strikes me every time when I start having a pity party. You know what God told him and all that? When he was still sick, when the boils was on his head and down to his foot, when his uh, family was lost, when his friends had forsook him and told him everything under the sun he'd done wrong. You know what God told him then before he dealt with him? Gird up your loins. Get your boots on. Get your britches on. And let's talk about the matter. That's what he told him. You say, well, preacher, I don't know about that. I like for God to come by once in a while and kind of nudge me, prod me, scoop me up. God told Job to get to gird up his loins. There's no better time than right now to get right with the Lord. There's no better time than right now than to serve the Lord. I want you to also see the second reason. No matter is of greater importance. Lost person, you might have business deals going on that I'll never understand. If it gets much more than $100, I probably won't understand it anyway. I'm kind of like it, so to speak. You may have propositions. You may have things coming up in your life, big events, maybe planning a wedding. I don't know, maybe uh, uh, getting ready to buy a house. Uh, matters of great importance, but you'll never face a greater matter of importance than salvation or service, if you will, to Jesus Christ. 
Salvation for the lost, Christian service for you. You say, well, preacher, I hadn't done much in the church. Uh, things has kind of been, uh, we've been busy over here, been busy over there. I know that. And that's not going to stop. What about committing to Jesus Christ? The third thing, third reason, no time is God more ready to save you than he is right now. Paul said there in 2 Corinthians 6 about verse number 2, I believe. Today is the day is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not yesterday. Tomorrow might not come. You might have plans to, to settle down. You might be sowing your wild oats now. You might be having a good time. Things, you're up on the mountaintop. Hey, I've been where you've been. And it's everything's going pretty good. To you young folk, let me tell you something specifically. One day you're going to look back and you're going to be like me. You're going to be 50 years old. One day you're going to look back and you're going to be like, like John and Virgil. And I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying. I don't think they'll mind me using them. You ladies, I wouldn't do that. You are silver-haired saints. Amen. I know. I, gotta, I know. Be careful. But listen to me. One day you're going to look back. And you ain't going to be near as young as you are. And you're going to be a little older. And old devil's going to tell you stories, boys. He's going to tell you to chase after this and chase after that. And it's going to look real good. Oh, it's going to look pleasing. But then there's going to come a day of reckoning in your life and in my life. And I thank God my sins run under the blood. But I'll never forget my uh, dear friend that's gone on to be with the Lord, Brother Gary Sewell, made a statement teaching one Sunday morning. If anybody could teach the Bible, Gary Sewell could teach it. He made the statement. He said, I'm still paying for some of my bad decisions. Hmm. Something to that effect. Now, I love the man. I'm not there beating him up. He's dead and gone. As my mama says, we don't talk ill of the dead. But still, I've never forgot that statement. This was a man who was doing all he could to serve the Lord. But he said, some of my decisions didn't add up. I, and that was a Christian man speaking it. What I'm saying is, oftentimes in our youth, we think the whole world is before us. And it ought to be. We ought to have a good time. We ought to enjoy life. But we ought not to put off the matter of salvation. We ought not to wait, as Felix said, a more convenient time. Maybe when somebody who's here, maybe when brother or sister so-and-so is not here, uh, they'll, they'll start looking at me and thinking a little less of me. The devil used to use that. And he said, you know what your mom and daddy, if you know your mom and daddy thought or knowed what you was doing, how would they think? I know how they'd think, but he'd use that against me. If they knowed what you's doing, what would your preacher think of you? You know what, when it comes down to it, it don't really matter. When it comes down to the matter of salvation, it don't matter. Because it matters what you do with this man, Jesus. That is what's going to matter. And if you get the good, so to speak, if you get, that, if you get salvation to the hilt, to the fullest, then you'll do like these folks we see in the, uh, the Bible, we, uh, a lot of these witnesses and testimonies. You'll, you'll want to change your ways. I didn't say you'd be perfect. I didn't say it'd be a cakewalk. Trials and tribulations, troubles and sorrows, they still come. Ups and downs still come in life. But quit trying to find you a better time. God is ready to save you now. No time is God more ready to save you than he is now. And then the last one, the fourth point. No one or nothing can bring peace to your heart like the gospel can. I want you to stop and think about that in just a moment. Do you have peace in your heart as we sit here today? Man, I know what it's like to not have the peace of God rule in my heart. It ain't pleasant. Sleepless nights. Worries aggravated, agitated, mad at the world. When you allow the peace of God to rule in your heart, sometimes you can't explain it. It just has to come out. Friend, the world is going to lie to you to your dying breath. I love you enough to challenge you with the truth. I don't want to see one of you suffer. I don't want to see another one have to bury a loved one. But if time tarries, we know it's coming, right? Jesus said, or the Bible says there's a peace that passes all understanding. And only Jesus Christ can give you that peace in the matter of salvation. I can tell you that you're a sinner. I can tell you the remedy for your sin is Jesus Christ. I can tell you how to come. I can tell you what to pray. But until you're ready to do it right here in your heart and open your heart's door to Him, 
The Bible speaks of the circumcision of the heart, a circumcision of the flesh. Same thing if you're talking about in the New Testament. It's simply that cutting out, if you were cutting away that old hard heart and letting Jesus Christ put inside you a new heart. Would you receive him today? Is there really ever going to come a more convenient time? And I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Satan is telling some of you now, if you'll just wait, there'll be a better time down the road. I wonder if we'd be honest. Those of us who tried our best to be faithful and realize, looking back, no, there's no better time to serve God than right now. I'd like for you, as we conclude this morning, to consider these four reasons. Sister Carol, if you will, come on. She's going to play something for us here in a minute. We might just have play, and I don't know. If we've got music, we'll sing. But I'd like to see you surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. It, nothing would please me more, please the church folk more. See a sinner give his heart, give her heart and life to the Lord. You say, preacher, I, I don't know if I can come out in front of folk. Well, the Lord said something about that as well. He said, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, I'll be ashamed to confess you before my Father. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I just, it's hard for me. I understand. I know the old cliche is that first step's hard and the rest of them you don't remember. That may be the case. But it's an individual matter, and it's of great importance this morning. I'll give you four reasons why there'll never be a more convenient time to either sur uh, surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ or to begin serving Him as you know you should. If you already made that decision, you serve Him as if your life depended on it. If you're about to make that decision, if you're making that decision, you serve Him as if your life depended on it. And I promise you, God will bless you for it. He will. Would you be honest with God this morning? Sister Carol, what are we playing? 177. This morning, I want you to stand. Page 177 in the hymnal. Are you washed in the blood? That's pretty simple. That's a direct question. That needs a direct answer. Friend, you have a need this morning. need to gather around this altar. Christian, I want to help you pray. Lost person, I'll show you the plan of salvation. I won't keep you up here. We won't do nothing out of the way, but we'll be in the Word of God. I promise you that. It won't make a scene. won't cause a scene. I might, I'll have a little spell shouting with Jesus with you, but I promise you what, I'll not cause nothing. I won't do anything contrary to the Word of God with sweet Holy Spirit. Would there be one here this morning as we sing? <laughs> personal question friend can you answer it can you answer it with affirmative yes are you washed we'll sing one more verse and no one moves we're going to close the invitation I thank you for your attention this morning. I tell you, this third week here, I feel liberty in this pulpit, and I thank God for that. That tells me a whole lot of what I need to know. Amen. I trust the message will do what God would have it to do. You take up with the Lord. As a matter, if I can help you in any way, I'm a phone call away. If I can uh, do anything for you, please reach out to me. I certainly get a joy getting to know you folk. Remember these requests of prayer with its, uh, these on our prayer list, these families. Uh, I still remember the Newman family, the Farmer family, both of those as well as I think uh, they mentioned uh, Chandra's dad. I also remember that one, if you will. Uh, many others on our prayer list. Let's continue to remember these. Those traveling, unable to be with us today, whatever the reason, let's remember them as well. Does anybody have, anybody have anything before we dismiss? 
It's good to be in the Lord's house. We'll dismiss in prayer. Father, again, we thank you this morning for allowing us this opportunity to come and gather. We thank you for the sweet liberty and the sweet spirit we feel in this place. Lord, I pray for our congregation. Lord, the good folk here at Colson, I pray that as we go out into this world, Lord, that you'll put a hedge of protection about them. Father, you'll give them boldness and uh, courage to be a witness uh, to someone this week, Lord. For now is the time. There'll never be a more convenient time to accept Christ, a more convenient time to tell somebody about Christ, a more convenient, to serve, a more convenient time to serve Christ. Bless each one. Watch over them. Keep them safe. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You're at liberty.